This is We the Sales Engineers Podcast, show 31. Welcome to We the SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. Ramsey proposed to me three times, and I actually said yes to all three of them, so I'm not quite sure what happened there. Hello, SE Nation. Have I got a treat for you today? Today's interview is with Greg Holmes. And Greg is a very busy guy. He's a director for sales engineers. And he's busy to the point where he had to squeeze me in while he was waiting at the airport for a flight. Because we're at the airport, we did have a couple technical issues. But the information he provided was well worth it, at least at least to me. It was an awesome interview, in my humble opinion. Which, if you know me, it's not very humble. So here's a quick tip of the day, and it came from Greg during the interview. If you're in a meeting and people you don't know are introducing themselves, each one of them may have a different goal. So it's good to know what these goals are. And during my conversation with Greg, he provided an example on how to do this. So hopefully you'll find that as useful as I did. And there are many more tips that I got from Greg and I'm not going to be able to fit them all into this uh, quick tip section. So listen up to the interview and take notes if you have time. If you're driving, do not take notes. I think that's illegal in some countries. So the show notes for the book, so the, the show notes for the books that we discussed and the topics are, uh, are at the website at we the sales engineers.com slash show 31. And before we start, I know a few of you have provided uh, reviews on iTunes, and I appreciate that. One particular comment mentioned that the content is excellent, and that might be my words, not his or hers, but the audio hurts the ears sometimes in some uh, episodes, uh, depending on the guest and their microphone. I appreciate the feedback, and that feedback kind of gave me the kick to grow some grow a pair let's put it that way and let my guests know when their audio is not good enough and i promise from this point on that i will ask them to either change the mic or reschedule until they have a better mic because i don't want to cause any health issues for anybody so i will do that and if anyone else has any feedback whether you want to provide it to me through the review which I just figured out how to read because I'm in Canada. I can't see the reviews in the U.S. unless I do a little trickery, which I found. And some of you might find that not really trickery. But you can also do that by signing up to the mailing list and we can start a conversation there because I try to connect with every single one of my uh, uh, subscribers, mainly because I don't have that many. So it gives me the chance to actually have a conversation with each one and every one of you. So... Do that. I take your constructive criticism to heart. I haven't had any haters, as they say. Everything was has been constructive, so I appreciate that. And I try to make the show, the show better for you. All right, so enough with that heartfelt crap. Let's get on with the show. Hey, Greg, welcome to the show. Hey, Ramsey. Good to be on. Well, thank you for coming on. And thank you for coming on from an airport, out of all places. And uh, I know you're busy... You sound like you're kind of uh, in transit, so let's get this started. Yeah. So before we start, I just wanted to mention to the folks listening that you're you have a blog post, a uh, blog site, uh, Sales Engineer yeah. Guy. Yeah, just salesengineerguy.com. Um, I used to post you know, probably ten to twenty articles a year on it. It's probably slowed down a bit recently, but there's no reason why I shouldn't you know, find a bit more time to, to get back and, and put more into it. So I'm always interested in new ideas. And, you know, I like to use the, the site just as a way to really share my thoughts and maybe helps me get my, my thoughts together before I, I start to to work with other people on them. So, yeah, and you're, you're one of the first blog websites that I found for sales engineers. Before, before that, I really didn't find anything else. So thank you for doing that. And before we, I start asking you a whole bunch of questions and uh, maybe you can introduce yourself to the folks listening. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So um, my name's Greg. I'm an Australian. I'm now living in the UK. 
Uh, I've pretty much lived out of Australia for the last 15, 16 years. Um, so, you know, pre-sales really from the beginning of my, my career, um, about 18 years or so ago. And, you know, since then I've been doing pre-sales operations in over you know, 20, 23 countries. Um, you know, lots of travel, even today, um, which wasn't always expected when I, when I signed up to today, but it's, it's a good slot for me, so it works well. Okay. Um, I, I started with, you know, some, some areas like uh, infrastructure, like deployment, endpoint management, and progressing through a few other things, you know, patch management, Windows deployment, and these days I'm all into license compliance optimization, something we call ITAM. So that's my functional area at the moment. And we're, we're really interested in cloud cloud spend and diverse hybrid kind of environments for, for, for the business kind of point of view. Right. And from your title, you're a pre-sales director. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. So yeah, we've got a sizable European team. So I, I have, you know, 11 direct reports across Europe and India. And then, um, you know, we're, we're part of a, a bigger unit. We're over about 20 people all over Europe. Uh, and I'm um, assuming sales engineers report to your reports or report to you and your and your structure from? At the moment, they're, they're pretty much all direct to me. But yeah. There would be space in that structure for some other pre-sales managers in, in that structure. All right. So I was trying to get to that. You make decisions on who you hire, who you don't hire in terms of sales engineers. and Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's a, a big, big part of the job. Yeah. So what would you say, like when you're interviewing someone, what would grab your attention the most that you say, no, I have to hire this guy? It's a, it's an excellent question. I think the, the number one thing that we can't really easily teach people is how to be a good listener. Right. So someone who will, you know, not just be out there to prove how smart they are, because there's plenty of smart pre-sales people and how technical they are or how business orientated they are, but ultimately how good they are at listening to what the other person wants, adjusting their style, you know, being ready to, to add from their knowledge. But ultimately, you know, the, the listening skill is one of the strongest things that we're looking for. Sorry, what was that? The listening skills. Yeah, that was the joke. <laughs> I like it. I'll play the stooge all day if you want. <laughs> no, no. That, no, definitely didn't mean that. All right. So you're looking for good listeners. And would you hire SEs or people who want to be SEs uh, if they don't have any experience, but they show that they're good listeners or they have to have previous experience as SEs? So I would say I've brought in a mix of them both, right? So a number of people have joined my team as you know from services backgrounds or support kinds of backgrounds who demonstrated that they were, you know, they were able to take the business angle, you know, what are we trying to sell? Why did the customers want it and, and understand the real value for it? But but yeah, that those people often have those kinds of listening skills that we're looking for. All right. And uh, so if I can summarize that you would only look for people who have experience with customers or show that they have listened to customers to come up with a business uh, case? It depends on the role. So with with my team at the moment, you know, many of them are stretched over you know, different countries in Europe. And if I was to bring someone in who didn't have that kind of, if I wasn't sure that they would cope in a pre-sales environment, I think it's a bigger struggle if they're in a more isolated role. But if, if I had, you know, a, a more consolidated team, I'd be certainly open to bringing in someone that I thought had the potential but hadn't proven it yet. Um, but, you know, you need you need the right kind of role and support structure if you're going to do that. Okay. And so you mentioned listening is one of the top soft skills that you would want SEs mm -hmm. to have. Is there any other soft skills that you would look for while you're doing them hiring? Yeah, yeah. So I think the ability to, to present and sound authoritative, you know, someone who can become somewhat of the, the trusted advisor for the customer. Um, so you need to, to believe they're confident when they are confident in what they're saying, when they're trying to say something that they, they are presenting something 
that they they understand. You want to see their conviction, and but but also that they're still willing to to, to use you know adjust their style according to their audience. So some yeah you know, presentation skills are a big one for me. Um, understanding the customer business value is another thing. Um, and you know that can depend on the kind of market, right? Some some tools are very infrastructure focused, or they fit you know into IT or something like that. Um, that there is still business value, but often I've I've seen sales cycles of those kinds of things go without people really considering the business value, or why would they buy a you know a two thousand unit over a fifteen hundred unit? You know it might come down to just one particular technical feature, but the more you understand why would they buy anything at all and what's the business value it's it's offering them you might be able to suggest one unit over a different kind of option when you say change his style or her style uh mm -hmm. what what does that mean exactly what, what what style are we talking about yeah so you know you get some situations where you're talking to a, a more business oriented buyer rather than a, a technical audience and it still could be a pre-sales kind of role, right? You're you're doing you know a result of your proof of concept. If you are presenting to the project team, you, they might want to see a, a bit more of the the rigor, the under the you know the, the underlying results. How did we get to that conclusion? Whereas if you're presenting to the the business leader, you might only get you know five slides to explain the business value of your proof of concept. But you need to give them the assurance you've certainly done a, a deep investigation, but you don't want to bore them with those details or, or you know, go into the details that are unnecessary for the, the decision. So uh, have, you, have you witnessed someone not change their style and what was the effect of that on the deal in the end? Yeah, I've certainly witnessed it. I'm, I'm sure I've been as guilty of it as other people in my time as well. Um, but, you know, I think that presentation that, you know, you, you're just keen to get through your deck of slides that you've prepared rather than, you know, if, if you get to slide five and they're actually fully bought into the idea, they don't necessarily need to see the next hour of slides you prepared based on, on the demo or, or things like that. I think that's one of the key things. You need to know when to stop, and and you know that's probably when you need to start listening as well, right? And that's probably one of the few things that that, that mean is why people don't don't adjust in time is that they're not understanding the situation they're in. I can give an example to that, which first happened when I when I first started as a sales engineer, and I didn't know I actually did that until after I got feedback, where uh, in our in our uh, stuff that we sell, we have physical equipment and we have the virtual equivalent of that. And my customer wanted to see uh, a demo about the virtual equipment. So I went and I started doing the demo. I started explaining what's happening and I see them all glaze over. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, have you guys done this before? He's like, yeah, we've all done this with hardware. I'm like, well, it's exactly the same thing. They're like, okay, we're good. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I guess we're done. We're done here and I'm like, oh crap! Did I just mess this up? And when I walked out, so the the senior uh, product manager said I just did the best demo he's ever seen because I didn't I talked five minutes. Which, yeah, that's and that can be an audience thing too, right? Some people in your audience might think it's a fantastic demo, and then the guy in the corner who's actually paying for it, yeah, um, you know, nothing in the demo was specifically for them. I think if you've got a mixed audience. Uh, understanding your audience and knowing how to deliver something for everyone in a session is, is very important. And, and maybe knowing the limitations of each person. So if the, if the CIO is attending a demo for some reason, um, but you know he's only probably in the room for the first 20 or 30 minutes, I think you'd keep that first 20 or 30 minutes specifically high level for the CIO with the promise that we can go deeper into this once I've satisfied, you know, the high level needs. And, you know, you, you even give that roadmap what to expect in this session that you're running for them. And I, I guess that gives the impression that you're taking his job into consideration. Hey, I showed you everything you need to know. If you want to step out, I can continue with the rest of the team. So 
yeah. people tend to appreciate that. So going back to yeah. my, my example of me doing a mm -hmm. good demo, but if it yeah. wasn't for the the product manager who was there, the senior product manager, to give me that feedback afterwards, I probably would have like uh, pooed my pants afterwards because I just, in my mind, I screwed up the demo. Yeah. And I am remote, yeah. like the rest of your team. How how would people like me who are remote know what they're doing right or wrong? Yep, it's a good question. I think sometimes I think if you've got a recording of the session, I think you can record a session for any old customer because you, you say if, if any of your teammates missed this, I can send the recording to them. And that way then you have a recording you can use for your own training and education. And, you know, I've listened to myself and my team, you know, deliver things and, and even if it's one of the best presentations ever you will hear you know maybe have people in the audience start to stop listening or maybe they they ask a question that's from 10 minutes before and you know you you always learn something that you could have done better so I, I find recordings is a good thing and if you can't record if you've got you know your salesperson in the session or another team member they they can always catch things that you might not be noticing because you're in the middle of delivering you know, a presentation or you're trying to load up that next screen in the product that is being reluctant and doesn't want to load up when you want it to. Um, so you know, you've, got, you've got to leverage those resources if, if you want to get better. Right. Yeah, well, it's like uh, sports teams, like the football teams. Mm. They watch tape after their game just to see what they did right or wrong. Uh, but for yeah. some reason... They also practice, which I don't think sales engineers practice nearly enough for whatever. Yeah. Like we may yeah. take half hour before a demo just to run through it. And yeah, know, but it's pretty much the same thing. Why don't we practice bef before we have to do the job there then right at, right right after? Yeah, uh, there's no point in complaining about that one slide that had the bad reveal on it or, you know, last year's information after the demo. Yeah. If you didn't have a dry run, then it's it's really everyone's fault who's involved, right? You you should spend at least you know half an hour getting understanding your plan of the situation of the the meeting that you you want to have, understand what the the ideal outcome is, and I think sometimes a good question for the salesperson is what what outcome do you want from this meeting? I think that's always a a really strong way of of starting the discussion even before maybe you've put together the full plan of what do you want to show that? Yeah. It's what do you want? Why are we even going there? So on my website, I have uh, like a document up there of my note format. And the top mm. thing that I have to fill up before the meeting comes up is the goal of the meeting. And that's something I have to decide with my account manager. Because if I don't have a goal, what am I working towards? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and that, that sounds like a really sensible approach. I mean, I think one thing we're trying to do is, is understand how to allocate pre-sales resources in a smarter way, right? Rather than just give open access to the sales team. Um, sometimes we, we really need, you know, you know, to, to choose optimally, you know, what, what deals are we pushing in a quarter? Who, who, you know, is this deal better than the other five that we could be trying to push? And by having some kind of a request and an understanding of why why this meeting or why this opportunity and how much do we have to invest overall in the long plan of what are we trying to do. I do have a question that's off topic for what we're talking mm -hmm. about right now, but it just popped in my head. We have some organizations where the sales engineering team reports a sales engineering director and then like it's a different tree than the salespeople. And then we have yeah. other organizations that are merged where the sales engineer and the salesperson might report to the same manager. Uh, yeah. W which one have you found to be more efficient in terms of sales and in terms of like uh, SE sanity? Yeah, this is a fantastic question. I think it depends on the, where the organization is in its lifetime and its structure. So, you know, I think there's times where you need a lean and mean kind of um, org structure um, that might be more focused on branch offices and individuals working together as a, a mixed skills team under a general kind of manager, um, which is, is good at a certain time. But I feel like in that situation, the individuals in, who are focused on 
pre-sales. And you could probably say the same thing for the salespeople in those organizations. Because you're in a blended team, you don't get to focus so much on the skills that will make you better. Hey, Greg. Welcome back. Hey. hey. Sorry about that. No, all good. That's what happens when we, uh, when you dick the initiative and do this from the airport. Uh, things happen and we're going to roll with it. So you mentioned, you were, we were talking about um, the different organizational structure and how that affects uh, the sales engineering team and the sales team. Yeah, absolutely. So just to start that bit, um, if you have, uh, you know, a new, a single product, you know, in your company or you've, you're a relatively new organization in a startup kind of environment. I think that the, the branch office mentality really does help, right? You've got a close tight knit team. You might not have you know, many resources around uh, for, for back office functions and things like that. Uh, so having a common team in a, uh, around a, you know, a general manager or a managing director or something like that can be really effective at getting a team up works together and makes things happen. I think one of the, the problems for bigger organizations is once you get divided up into different functions and silos, sometimes the communication suffers and um, you know, not having that you know, team approach in the, the sales team can be you know, a limiting factor. But once, once you've got multiple teams and multiple branches, then I think you do get some efficiencies by, by having separate structures because that's when you can start to think about having experts in particular subject matter areas. You can have business value experts. You have experts that you can't afford to put in every single team, but that you want to have available as part of the overall structure. And so I think that's when, you know, for us, you know, separating out a pre-sales function as a separate team was really valuable and effective. Um, it meant that you can also, you know, afford to have more specialists, but also local resources where you need them. And I think that's a, a helpful thing. No, I, I have a few, like I've seen companies that are big companies that have the SEs and the salespeople report to the same person. And mm -hmm. maybe you can alleviate this fear for me, but I do have a fear of having to report to a VP of sales or a, or a director of sales just because I've seen the way it works for us that everything's important for the salesperson, yeah. but we have, and the salespeople work in like 15 minute stretches versus uh, SEs where they have to sit for an entire afternoon to work on a demo or a POC or whatever. So. Yeah. So I think, you know, nothing is correct and nothing's always going to stay as the correct option forever in an organization as well. Right? Sometimes changing this over will yield a benefit um, and optimize you know a different aspect i think if you're in a big company where you're, you're reporting into the sales function the, the main things i'd want to watch out for are still getting some say globally aligned time for pre-sales resources in different teams to work together on improving you know common resources so you know everyone should see the benefit in that but then organizationally you need to get some sign off at a high level uh, for those kinds of activities to be successful. Um, I think doing it ad hoc means that you won't be able to get the alignment on multiple teams at the same time uh, to make those things rea a reality. So I, I think just finding those ways to get the well-being of the individuals taken care of, and then you still might want some kind of matrix structure where you might have some central you know, global heads for these things, even if they don't directly own the teams but that they, they have the care about the function and, and making sure that it's successful in, in, the, you know, in a very large organization. So correct me if I'm wrong, and this is a feeling that I have. I have no data to back it up, but I feel like SE managers care more about the individuals, about their team as people, whereas when you go to sales, they care about, I'm not saying they don't care about their individuals, but they care more about the quota retired at the end. So is, is that a common thing is that just me how does it work it, it probably depends on the team but i have seen yeah i think pre-sales is a function where you don't want the same level of churn that might happen naturally in a sales team um because those resources in you know pre-sales people take longer to to come up to speed with new products you know it's you need to make a bigger investment in their long-term well-being and i think individually 
Uh, I don't think people really want to be swapping the products that they're supporting every year or, or you know, even making big changes in the sales people that they're supporting regularly. So I think from a, an individual point of view and from a company point of view, I think there's an interest in having pre-sales people have a, a good, you know, care in terms of how they grow as individuals and how they're, they're developing their skills long term. Um, you know, you do support the sales process though, so you do want to make sure you support it in hitting its goals. Yeah. All right. Well, now that thank you for letting me take you on this tangent, and I appreciate it. It helps me think about things a little bit differently. So, if we go back to where yeah. we were, um, for SEs, we talked about some soft skills that you look for in SEs. Would they be different from like when we're working with the customer in the customer's eyes? Is there a difference? Do they look? Are they looking for other soft skills? Are they looking for soft skills from the SE, or like what do you think about yeah. from that perspective? Uh, I do think it's an area that pre-sales people in general probably could gain the most, right? I think you need to be able to understand the audience you're talking to, read the room, um, be able to make sure that you're connecting to the different people you're talking to um, and not just delivering, you know, a verbal or a technology demo or a presentation of some kind. Um, you need to get into the, the, the situation you're trying to work in. So, you know, I think that's why the soft skills are very important. Um, there is a, a large number of different soft skills, I think, uh, that can be important in a pre-sales team. Um, so, you know, you could go into some of those in detail if you want. Sure, yeah, by all means. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, part of this is, is things like being clear in your documents, you know, making sure you can set expectations, you know, even setting uh, a control of the situation. Uh, and this I mean, you know, if you have a, a proof of concept as part of your sales process, uh, being able to be very clear about circumstances you'd want to be true before you commit to one, um, understanding what would be the success criteria, how would they be measured, so being able to set goals and manage those expectations. Um, part of that's negotiation, right? So you, you could be negotiating the difference between, a, you know, I've heard people ask for a three-month evaluation, and, and then at the end of the day, you could agree that what they actually really need is someone to come in and, and hold their hand and, and understand the system does what they want, but that could be achievable if you can both agree on a, a three to five day kind of window or even a, a, a one hour demo might be the right thing, depending on what the organization really needs. Uh, but you, know, you need to understand the why, you know, why are they asking for something that seems unreasonable or hard for your organization to give? So uh, you mentioned, all right, there have a bunch of follow ups. Uh, you said understand the audience a few times so far. How, if how the, can someone understand the audience? Like, is it something that they practice, or is it built innate, or how does it work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the start of most you know on-site meetings, you go around the table and and introduce each other to the um to the meeting, and I think taking the time to really listen at that time and understand who seems to be sure that they're in the right meeting, first of all, how they introduce themselves and their role and the relevance of this meeting to them, I think is an important thing. And, and you, I think it's fair even to qualify people if they say they're here for, for something um, and you're unsure of what that means, you know, if, you know, are you in charge of server infrastructure or, or cloud-based infrastructure? You know, that kind of, uh, follow-up question to them their introduction could be very relevant and could affect how you want to, to present to them. So I think understanding people and as much as possible what their motivations are in the meeting or in the long-term results of the initiative um, is important. I think you know when you're, you're planning with the, the salespeople, you might be wanting to, to assign goals to, to different individuals and uh, work out who is actually on the, the buying committee or the decision-making committee for the initiative you're a part of and the better you understand what people want um, because you will understand it from a, a technical or maybe technical business kind of point of view but you'll have a certain understanding of the, the needs of each of the individuals and that might differ from what your salesperson does. 
there are so many gems in what you just said. So when we do introductions, generally speaking, everybody says their name, what they who they, what they are, and that's it. We move on. I don't think anyone on my team has ever thought to follow up about that. So there's a simple tip right there. Um, would you ask what they want, what they're looking for out of this meeting? Is that a question that you would ask at the start, or would that open up a can of worms? Yeah, it depends. I mean, if you're in a very formal, you know, ten-person meeting and you you don't feel like you've earned the right to ask that, then then maybe you can't. But you 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 should feel like you know if it's going to hold you back from achieving the goal of the meeting for everyone, you know, you're doing them a favor as well you know, uh, by understanding exactly what they want. Um, you might need to hold it back until the beginning and you, set, you, you could refer back and say, uh, John, I understand that you said you're, you're you know, looking for you know, a way to manage the software in this environment. Now, you know, which kind of software do you mean? Can you elaborate? I think giving that back to them there shows, A, you were listening, B, you're interested in what they've got to say, and C, it might actually make a difference to how you go on from that. All right. That, that, yeah, that sounds good to me. I'll do that next time. That's <laughs> perfect. See, that's why I do this podcast, because I tend to learn a lot having discussions with people. Hopefully, whoever's listening gets to it, but I do it for selfish reasons, and I'm learning. So, no, no, no. That's perfect. That's very good. So, how, like, other than, like, okay, understand your audience, then you have listening, then you have a bunch of stuff. How does one practice doing that? We don't, we're never given a guide and usually someone has it or he doesn't, mm. which is not really the case. Now, I think if you don't have those skills, but you recognize the gap, I think that's the first step, right? It's, it's one of these things. If you're making mistakes all the time and you're unaware, then you're never going to be able to fix those mistakes. So the first step it has to be that awareness and, and willingness to change. Um, some people, you know, I've seen people who've been able to change their style to a, a large extent. You know, it's not their natural style, and they, they realize they're, they're doing it you know, maybe mechanically or they've worked out a way that works for them to stop them from making mistakes. Um, but they do change their style, and, and it does end up working, right? And I think once you've established a way to make it work, and then you're consciously on the, the path of doing it, the right way or, or making improvements i think that's when it becomes more natural for people all right so let's take a, an example uh, other than listening let's say i don't know someone is a humorless as an example and they're aware of that how can they work on getting some humor injected into their i know i'm putting you on the spot but uh, if you, there's another example we can choose that but that's the first thing. I, know, I think that's a great example. I mean, it could be you know you you want to inject some humor to break the ice in your in your presentation because you're normally maybe a very matter of fact kind of person. I think if you're not a natural you know teller of jokes or something, you you can certainly learn a little bit about delivery, even if it's a bit mechanical. You could even play on that as being part of your delivery style. Um, but I, I would say just make yourself your meeting notes and say, you know, step one, Greg tells a really terrible joke, but that one is in, you know, in keeping with the style of the meeting. And, you know, you might need someone who's good at telling jokes to tell you some jokes in order to inject them into the meeting. But it, it still might be an interesting gimmick and a way to, to get some more personality into your part of the, the, the session. Right. And there's a lot of resources on, like, go on YouTube and look for jokes. So there, there are resources yeah. out there. Yeah. Okay. But of course, it's it's more. I think it's more effective the more in the in the, the setting. You know, if as long as it's something that makes it fit to the kind of setting you are. You know, maybe there's something specific about your kind of technology, or maybe there's a a really funny Dilbert, you know, cartoon slide of of the your very subject matter. I mean, there's there's several on sales engineering itself. You know, so you could you yeah. know use something like that to to add a piece of 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 humor to your your uh, session and, and in fact and that makes your session memorable from the get-go though they'll, they'll remember you as the guy who told that that crazy joke yeah and it, and it might anchor you in their mind you know i have some situations where we have 
uh, we're, we're responding to RFPs and we're invited in for a talk about our response and we find out that we're one of eight different responses all, all about the same thing. If you can make your presentation stand out and be memorable, even if you're you know, offering the same sort of thing as everyone else, I think that still puts you ahead in terms of being called back to the, the next level. All right, cool. All right, so one of the main topics we wanted to talk about is the role of SE in customer success. And I feel like it's a big role that's usually underappreciated. So what, what can an SE do as part of the sales team to ensure customer success? Yeah. So let's just wind it back in and talk what about customer successes first. And I think, you know, one thing with where the world began selling software is a perpetual kind of thing or even just no maintenance, just a one-off sale. And so the, the getting new business in was the main way that organizations would care about the value of customers to them. I think these days we've changed a lot. And so the, the recurring revenue that you get, whether it's maintenance or a full you know, three-year subscription where it's the annual renewal becomes the most interesting thing for a business. Um, so you, I think customer success is just a reality. If you don't make your customers su succeed in their business sense, then they're not going to renew and your ultimate value is, is very limited and it's actually harder to sell back to a company that you haven't made succeed in the past. So, you know, it makes the pre-sales roll harder, you know, if, if we're trying to, to bring in new business. And if you think that the, the primary role of pre-sales is just bringing in new business, um, then you need to be bringing in new business in a way that is making sure that those customers will be successful in the long term. Um, so, and you know, there's several things there. One is pre-sales shouldn't, you know, or the sales team can't now oversell what they're trying to sell. They need to make sure that they're, they're selling a reality or an achievable vision to the customer. Um, that two, you, you also need to make sure that you do everything that your organization can to make them successful. So if it's, I don't know if it's necessarily pre-sales to be responsible for this. Some companies have a very flattened role where pre-sales turns into post-sales kind of implementation care and things like that, or they can be very different groups. But making sure that once the customer is on the, the buying decision, once they know that they're buying the product, that the transfer to the next stage needs to be as swift and effective as possible from your organization. So that there's, you know, the, the less time that you waste in that handover, the quicker the customer will be actually getting value from your technology. Uh, now that could be as simple as them getting something and turning it on, or it could take them months and months of implementation and updates and then actually doing work in the system. But whatever that length is of time, you need to do whatever you can in the handover to making sure that's a reality. I, well, I, I think the third main thing, do you want, no, yeah, go, sorry, Ramsey. No, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, just the third main thing is really just in the long term, I think pre-sales have a role in making sure that those renewals happen, you know, that customers are happy. But when they come back, either with questions or challenges, or they're just interested in what additional value your organization can offer, you know, upsells and cross-sells of new functionality, I mean, that comes back to pre-sales then as another area to be helping. So I, th I think we can't just rely on a one-off transaction as being the main role of pre-sales in the organization. And, and I was just going to give an example for a complex. So I used to work at Nokia mm -hmm. uh, and I did some post-sales work and I'd show up at a customer site for a two-week resident engineering gig. And on like I'm there for two weeks, maybe five days, the SE would drop by just to say hi, make sure everything's going well. And it's just that's how we make sure that the customer is successful. Although I'm doing all the work, he's just yeah. there to like support me if I need anything, support the 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 customer if they need anything. And I'm happy, they're happy. Everybody's happy, yeah. so they they end up buying a lot more. And he bragged about making his quota all from that company just because he kept them happy afterwards. So that's uh, a yeah, thing. Exactly. There's probably, you know, big, 
some incentive for them to come back and stay in touch with the, the post-sale care team, if you like. You know, so maybe a scheduled set of meetings or a, a triggered set of meetings after a certain amount of time. Um, it depends on the level of, you know, what, what kind of size of customer. You know, in larger customer environments, you might have, you know, physical on-site meetings post-sale for the pre-sales team to come along as well and make sure that the, the customer is realizing value, that they're, they're carrying on with the vision that was sold to them um, or that they, the reasons that they use to buy the product still are valid for them as well. So reminding, I, I think, your implementation team, uh, this customer is buying because they're very interested in, you know, and you could list out the top three things that they want or they have a particular date that they need to have something ready for or, you know, the, the compelling events that the, the, the buying cycle identified. If the customers meet those events and are happy, they're much more likely to, to spend more money with you in the long run and also that they're more likely to just renew and, and they won't query the renewal as much. Yep. I wanted to go back to something you mentioned uh, about not overselling. And mm-hmm. in, from my experience, I would say 50% of salespeople, that's what they do. They oversell. So how does an SE contradict a salesperson in a meeting to make sure that it's not being oversold without damaging his career? It's, it's a good point. So um, I would actually have a conversation before the meeting with the salesperson just to make sure, you know, if I'm if we're not agreeing in the session, how can I interrupt you or give you an indication that maybe what you're saying uh, isn't going to be correct? I mean, I, I don't think you should just straight up say that your salesperson is wrong, but you, you should ask uh, for permission to clarify or or revisit some topics later on in the meeting, maybe in more detail. Um, you know, and it, it is really annoying if they say something wrong and then you see the customer really jumps onto that. And it's like, if you can do that, then then obviously we're going to buy this and this will be really good for us. Then, then you know you're in trouble, right? <laughs> because A, you might have to prove it, but B, their long-term value and their long-term happiness is, is very like impact. The reason why something it turns out to be wrong. I think in the long run, you know, organizations that invest heavily in customer success, they might even have the customer success team have the right to come back and say, well, you know, we can't actually take on this business because, you know, we can't actually deliver what the customer is looking for. And in those cases, that, that, that might then trigger a, a renegotiation or something to, to work out what is realizable. Can we sell them something that is going to be achievable and agree with the customer on that? Yeah, and from, from what I've seen is whenever there's this case where that one thing that the account manager said that will actually close the deal, I haven't, I haven't mm-hmm. sold a lot of things without a proof of concept or a demo. And almost yeah. every time they want to see that in a demo and that's on me to show it to them, and if I'm going to be ethical, I'm not going to be able to show it to them unless I'm like doing a recording and like editing and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So it will come back to you yeah. anyways bef- before it might even get to the success team. So you might waste your time. Yeah. And- Definitely. But, but I think you also have, you know, there's times where you might say something like we support five of the biggest vendors for this. Yeah. And they assume you mean vendor six, which is yeah. the one that they use. And yeah. then you know that you definitely don't support that. That might be the time that you need to call it out in, in some way or say that, you know, we, we could look at doing that in the future. Um, I know those will damage the sales cycle, but it's equally going to damage customer success. So, you know, it depends how strongly your business is committed to, to making customers successful. And would doing that, not like would bringing it up that we don't support vendor six, have any benefit in the long run in terms of customer relationship would it affect it at all i think it'd be much more positive if you're you're clear if you think that they're making a false assumption it's better in the long run if you can come clean on that okay but you know it's it's an issue um you know you you can't also read their mind and there will be times where they you know you don't it's not your job to be abundantly clear but I think if, if you get the impression that they're certainly missing a point or you know, getting, believing it does something that it can't, then, then 
you need to back that up. All right. So don't shoot yourself in the foot, but mm. if something's obvious, declare it. Yeah. Um, all right. I wanted to go. So there's something you said in the previous question, which I forgot to ask about, uh, which is success criteria negotiation. Yeah. Is that something that you think the SE should be doing? Or whenever people hear a negotiation, that's directly put on the salesperson. But yeah. this seems more technical because we're talking about success criteria in terms of technology. Is this a yeah. SE thing or a salesperson thing? Yeah, um, I, I think it, it generally falls into whoever's going to be performing the technical proof needs to be agree in agreement with those success criteria for sure. Um, it, it does depend on and where does pre-sales enter the negotiations in your organization. But I, I believe firmly that the people who propose a proof of concept should be the pre-sales people who have to deliver it. Um, so I think what the salespeople can do to really make this effective is have a strong understanding of the business value and the business, um, the exact business problem. So have a good definition of the business problem from the customer. And then from that business problem, we get to need to map how will the customer accept that the proof of concept has been successful. And that's what I would call the success criteria. So they could be a very short list of high level things that if you can show A, B and C, then they should be able to sign off your proof of concept as being successful and move on from there. Or they could be a, a very detailed test plan. And so I think, you know, it would be a, a bit of cooperation, but I think that the pre-sales team should lead the discussion on what exactly are these success criteria. Um, if they're things that you've seen before, then that's great because then you can build up a library of success criteria that you can share among your team and then be ready to suggest the right kind of success criteria to customers, uh, assuming that they're, they're willing to, to be you know, a bit um, in agreement with what you want to run anyway. And if you don't have success criteria as pre-negotiated and then you go for a proof of concept, what mm. could possibly go wrong? Yeah, I think everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think your proof of concept doesn't really start until you have a, a firm idea of what is that concept? What are you? What are they going to agree to? And, and what is the follow-up from a successful proof of concept? So I think you need to, to really have a strong agreement of what does that success look like. And then you work back from there and get a strong agreement at the beginning of the proof of concept on what do you need to prove to make it successful. So I think if, if you find yourself in the middle of a proof of concept without success criteria defined, I think my best advice would be then to to draw aside your, your sponsor for the proof of concept and say, you know, we, we didn't really quite get clarity on what we're trying to, to prove here. And I'd like to sit down with you for, you know, whether it's a 20 minute discussion or a two hour discussion, but get some firm agreement on what is the end look like of this BOC and how can you measure success? And once you've got that, you know, it could be that they just want this extended play for three days. They want you to stand up a server and it doesn't die in three days time. I, I think that would be a funny uh, kind of success criteria, but as long as you can get an agreement on what does that success look like, then I think you can then proceed and then you have a real proof of concept to deliver against. All right. Well, this is a good spot to move on to the next uh, round. By the way, I like, I don't know when your flight is. Do we still have time? Oh, we've got about seven minutes of my time. Okay, then let's do That's this. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's change the not so fire round to a fire round and we'll get through this quickly then. So other than a notebook and a pen, is there an essential tool that a sales engineer should be using? I think notebook and pen could be the, the most basic. Yeah, you know, if you've got that, you could do anything. I think a whiteboard is, is really strong as well. Um, I, I like whiteboarding in general. I think it's a good way to explain many different topics. And, you know, you could run a, a business value workshop on a, on a whiteboard, or you could run a detailed architecture session, or you could just talk through the basics of the business value. And, but you wouldn't carry a whiteboard in your bag, I presume. <laughs> I, I know SEs who have them in their home offices. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah. I know of people who carry their whiteboard pens with them. It's right there. Uh, there we go. It's right there. It's not hooked up or anything. Yeah. yeah. 
No, that's good. Yeah. You need to mount that on the wall. Yes, I do. I'm just trying to find. Sp- so I just moved in. Yeah. Well, last year, and I don't have. I don't. I haven't figured out the logistics here. All right. Yeah. Uh, other than your blog post, my blog post, uh, is there a book or resource that every SE should uh, be exposed to? Yeah. So I started, you know, in my career, you know, not not having a lot of resources to help me. And I found a couple of things that were early on that really helped me, you know, understand, you know, maybe some of the things like sales engineering team structure and also how to approach a good sales process. Um, and John Kerr's book, Mastering Technical Sales, was one of those. I think we had him on the podcast a while back. Yep. Um, another one was really just on the art of doing a good demo. Um, and there's a, a book by Peter Cohen called Great Demo, which I found is pretty strong in instructional, in in getting to a focused kind of demonstration that really showed you know, that customer value. I think too many demos just seem to be a proof that you know a lot of different things about a product and you get the Harvard tour. Whereas I think a strong demo is really focused on a particular use case and getting to the value point as quickly as possible. So you, you, you might even want to start out by just showing the value and then working back towards that value from, from a more basic position. I think those, you know, those concepts are really strong and I think Great Demos really holds up still as a, a very strong book in terms of how to demo. Do you see a difference between software demos and hardware demos? I haven't been involved in enough in hardware demos, but I, I think you know the demo itself as part of a demo. I feel isn't the the biggest part of that that meeting, right? For any any product that I've been involved in, so I think you know I think a lot is in the setup and understanding that business problem. And I think if you if you're invited in just to do a demo and the salesperson assures you they've already done all of that other stuff, you know, here's the business case here's the you know the, the the requirement from the customer i think even if you pair it back and just say all right we've given you a business case around this business problem that that's been identified i just want to make sure i revalidate that with you and before i show you the demo because i don't want to waste your time or my time and i think building to the start of your demo and then when you start your demo it should be the most exciting part of the overall demo now I'm not sure personally how the most exciting part of a hardware demo is, but I, I'm pretty sure that that it, that it should have something, right? If yeah. if I was demoing just a mouse, you know, the latest in gaming mouse, I'm sure I could come up with a couple of you know strong features or you know use cases that are the real key parts of that. Well, for a gaming mouse, I would just show how fast it is on the screen, how I'm able to play a game, I guess. In the yeah. end, like from the way I saw it, it's like it all leads up to hardware. It all leads up to software. People have to see it in front of them, which means like, yeah, okay, yeah. they touch the they touch the mouse, it's good. But how does it work? Yeah. And now it's on a screen again, so everything tends to, in my opinion, tends to go back to the screen. All right. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks for time management or task organization? <laughs> um, I think just really. Um, dividing things up into importance and urgency, you know, okay. looking at what are the top urgency things, but more importantly, you know, what are the most important things? And you still need to leave time for those big strategic important things that are not urgent because they, they do make a big difference in the long run, right? And I think a lot of learning topics sit on that important but not urgent kind of I think for a lot of people, you know, if you have to learn a new product area and it's not easy for you, it's a bit of a gap from what you've done before, um, you, you know, often we, we like to learn things just in time before the demo, right? So I'll learn my script for this new product area and then I'll deliver it. Um, but it's not going to work if, if you need some background knowledge in the area. So I think to get there, uh, leave some time in your schedule, set it aside for those big things and spend that time, you know, coming up to speed with those new areas, learning, you know, what a, what a public cloud provider has in its, you know, kind of uh, infrastructure that, that you might need to interact with or, you know, some other area that might be new for you and, and spend time uh, strategically learning that. Um, the rest is, you know, you need to just <laughs> identify the biggest deals, uh, make sure that you're spending right time on the, the those things that will make uh, the difference between success and failure for your sales team. Okay. 
Uh, I have one more question, but uh, I know you have to go, so we can just skip that for now. No, you can for it, Ramsey. Okay. Well, what's the best advice you've ever been given? Uh-huh. That's great. <laughs> That's like a long answer. Um, I think, you know, you, you can't, you need to keep learning and developing yourself as a pre-sales person. I don't think someone else can come along and turn, you know, uh, someone who's just an average, you know, mediocre salesperson, also pre-sales person into a great one. I think the person needs to want to do it themselves. And you need to be brutally honest with yourself, you know, know where your gaps are, know when you've done a good job, but when you can do it better. And also know when you've done a bad job and you need to, to improve categorically. I think it, once you can identify those things, I think it's okay to be happy when you've done something good. You, you always learn more from your mistakes, of course. But, but remember, you just because you win a deal doesn't mean you did the right thing all along. And so you, you always have space to learn as you go. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you for your time and have a safe flight wherever you're going. Thanks, Ramsey. Off to Spain for the, a couple of days. Oh, nice. Not for, is it for, you're going for work? Yeah, I am going for work. Okay. Well, I hope you have time for some pleasure uh, down there. Go yeah, to the beach no, or something. it should be all right. All right. Awesome. Thank you for your time, Greg, and uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ramsey. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for hanging in there to the end of the show. Uh, I thought it was an amazing show. Lots of tips, lots of tricks. I hope you guys took notes and you have some idea how to implement it in your day-to-day -day activities, whether it's like recording your demos and then watching them later or practicing, learning, act, learning, active listening. These are all very important. And thank you, Greg, for bringing those up and for coming on and uh, squeezing us in through your busy schedule. This was very educational for me specifically, and I'm sure other folks uh, think so as well. Here's the outro tip. So I hope by now everyone listening knows that I do a little bit more than just podcasting. I, I do have a bi-weekly blog on different topics. I publish them on LinkedIn and on the website. Just click on the blog tab and you'll find my blogs. I I am starting to do monthly webinars. I've, so far, I've done only one, but I have another one scheduled for Saturday, November 24th. Hopefully, not all of you are on Thanksgiving, uh, are in a Thanksgiving party. So that that will be, if you're listening to the day of this release of this show being released, that'll be next Saturday. I also have some freebies on the website, uh, and which kind of give you tips on writing uh, great resumes or uh, meeting note templates, uh, a bunch of different stuff. If you like to have a hand in shaping where this f website is going, that so that it will be most beneficial to you, so you can get the most value out of it, I strongly urge you to sign up to the newsletter. And when I say newsletter, like I send a w one weekly newsletter uh, at this point, which tells you, hey, I have a podcast, they have a blog, in the same newsletter. So I don't bombard you with newsletter stuff it's the way i used to communicate with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis i don't blast out uh information a lot to a lot of people but it's my way of having this conversation so i can know what you guys want from me and how this website can serve you better so for example would you prefer more youtube videos i had i just had a chat with a gentleman today who said he would listen to the podcast if they were on youtube possibly so how many of you agree? Having uh, having you on the newsletter email list would help me ask that question to to you on a one-on-one -on -one basis and have a discussion with you. You can pretty much sign up on every page on my site, including the show notes for this episode, which is at we the sales engineers dot com slash show thirty one. Thank you guys for listening. For the folks sending me encouraging messages on LinkedIn, I really appreciate that. It like it's amazing to read. It pushes me forward. And I show them to my wife and she just understands what I'm doing to the community uh, to help the community get better and better. And she enjoys that. I enjoy it. And uh, it gives me excuse to come down here and work. So keep it going. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
with that, this is Ramsey signing off.